Bermuda, and Island Oasis 650 miles off the east coast of the United States. For centuries, it's been a refuge for Atlantic shipping, but the island's waters conceal a deadly threat. At the same time as being incredibly attractive, Bermuda also represents a, a, a serious no-go area for mariners without specific Bermuda experience. Bermuda's name comes to strike fear into the hearts of sailors and earns a reputation as the Isle of Devils. The paradox of Bermuda as paradise is that it was literally a, a ship's graveyard for its first two, three hundred years. As custodian of the wrecks, Philippe Rouja tracks and monitors Bermuda's historic shipwrecks. And there are plenty to keep him occupied. In fact, these waters may have claimed up to 300 vessels. Why have so many ships perished in these crystal clear seas so close to land? Philippe sets out to visit several wrecks that could shed some light on this mystery. First, the Mary Celestia, an iron-hulled steamship carrying supplies in the American Civil War. She left Bermuda, she came down South Shore and came to her demise right here, which is a very curious thing because we're literally only 800 meters from shore. And it happened on a flat, calm day. There's a lot of intrigue about it. Try There's clearly something out there that poses a deadly threat to shipping. To address this and other long-standing Bermuda Triangle mysteries, we need to see the underwater lay of the land. Removing the ocean layer by layer to gradually reveal an extraordinary landscape. Never seen before. To look into the Bermuda Triangle's depths, we use a fast evolving technology called sonar mapping. Sonar mapping fires sound waves to the ocean floor. The return signals display the shape and depth of the land beneath. And it's sonar technology that may help uncover the cause of the hundreds of shipwrecks surrounding the island. Hey, how you doing, Nick? All right, good, man. How you doing? Geologist Nick Hutchings is a modern-day prospector. He's using sonar mapping to hunt for signs of specific underwater formations close to where some of Bermuda's wrecks lie. Turn up and then run straight. What we're looking for are mineral deposits, and they could be in the form of extinct uh, vents, hydrothermal vents, known as black smokers. Nick believes the now extinct vents could contain rare metals and minerals. We would be looking at gold and copper. And with the crusts, there you're looking at platinum, cobalt, nickel, and particularly the rare earths. And the rare earths are, are important now because uh, they're vital to all of our modern technology. In order to seek out the valuable metals, Nick's using a multi-beam sonar device. The data reveal an extraordinary underwater landscape around Bermuda, including what appears to be a mountain edge. We have a, a big sort of flat plateau. It will steam out to what we call the edge. You get to the side and then it runs down at a slope of about 60 degrees. And that run down 350 fathoms. Why are we finding the edge of an underwater mountain just off the coast of Bermuda? To find out, we need to see the bigger picture. The latest sonar data from all around Bermuda allow us to virtually drain this entire area. With the water gone, the tiny island appears to perch on a spectacular mountaintop, a seamount two and a half miles high, all alone in the middle 
of the Atlantic Ocean. So how did it get here? The reason why the island is here today is because of a very significant volcanic eruption that took place in this relatively isolated spot in the ocean plate that st stretches from the, be the earliest phase of development of the Atlantic Ocean. The volcano grew bigger and bigger over millions of years until it finally towered above the ocean's surface. It erupted and completed a huge volcanic island that would have stuck up three or 4,000 feet above current sea level now. After the volcano became extinct 30 million years ago, wind and rain eroded the mountain down to a flat plateau. Then, as sea levels rose after the Ice Age, Bermuda was left as a small island on top of the seamount. Today, reefs have built up on the slopes of this ancient volcano and now surround most of Bermuda. Bermuda's reefs are our natural uh, barrier for protecting us from the fury of the ocean, but it's also been the, the sad fate for many, uh, many mariners. These reefs are potentially deadly to shipping, but it's what is living on the reef that poses an even more treacherous threat. Locally, they're known as boilers or breakers. Breakers are formed by a type of rocky algae and the shells of millions of tiny mollusks. Together, they create an incredibly hard limestone structure which can grow up to 35 feet from the seabed with the tops sometimes breaking the surface at low tide. The breakers themselves are actually materially harder than the surrounding reef, which is why they've survived and which is why the processes that created them have continued to persist. And so any ship encountering one of these things, wooden, metal or otherwise, would be in for a very serious impact. Breakers sometimes have sharp points. These can pierce a ship's hull like a can opener, potentially sinking it in minutes and they can be at their deadliest in calm weather. One of the ironies of breakers is that they're more visible when there's wave action and storms. So in fact, the breakers are sometimes at their most dangerous on a flat, calm day because they can't be seen at all. Breakers have caused many of Bermuda's shipwrecks. The Mary Celestia is one of them. This concealed threat surrounds Bermuda a deadly legacy of its volcanic past. Draining the island of Bermuda helps to explain the hundreds of wrecks found here. But this is only one small corner of a vast triangle that stretches from Bermuda at the northern point to Puerto Rico in the south, with the Florida coast forming the western tip and a World War II era flight out of Florida may be the best known of all the Bermuda Triangle myths. Flight 19, the Lost Patrol. Now, a dive team prepares to go in search of an aircraft involved in the baffling events of that day. As we drain deeper, new discoveries may finally help solve this mystery. December 5th, 1945. Five Avenger torpedo bombers take off from Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station in Florida. Flight 19, as it's codenamed, is a routine navigation training mission along the Atlantic coast. In command is U.S. Navy Lieutenant Charles Taylor, a highly experienced airman. He's led dozens of training missions, but is unfamiliar with this particular stretch of coast. Midway through the mission, things start to go wrong. Lieutenant Taylor reports trouble with his compasses. With the weather deteriorating fast, they're soon hopelessly lost. A PBM-5 Martin Mariner sets out on a rescue mission to locate the flight and guide the pilots back home. The Mariner calls in a routine message. After that, it's never heard from again. No wreckage has ever been recovered from Flight 19 or the Mariner rescue plane. 
All kinds of weird and wonderful theories have been put forth to explain the disappearance of these aircraft. From alien abductions to the effects of an electromagnetic fog. It's more likely the pilots simply got lost, ran out of fuel, and had to ditch somewhere over the ocean. The Mariner and Flight 19 ran into trouble somewhere in the area surrounding the Bahamas. For the first time, it's possible to drain this area to the seabed, around three miles down. Draining reveals a vast, featureless underwater zone known as the Abyssal Plain. It's like a gigantic underwater desert. And easy to see why the aircraft have never been recovered. But now, 70 years later, we may finally be close to finding the Martin Mariner rescue plane. Mike Barnett is a technical diver who specializes in hunting down lost aircraft. He's spent years investigating the Flight 19 incident and thinks he's got a pretty good idea where the Mariner crashed. I tried to recreate the flight path in my mind where this aircraft might have gone and where it went down. Starting off down here at Banan River Naval Air Station where the aircraft uh, launched from, it traveled north up to Cape Canaveral and then it headed offshore to rendezvous with the search area it was assigned. We know about a half hour after taking off, there was an explosion sighted. There's a freighter out there that recorded seeing an explosion midair. When the vessel got on site, they didn't find any debris. Either the aircraft sunk or portions of it were carried away by the Gulf Stream. Today, Mike and his team set out in search of the remains of the lost aircraft. The site we're going to investigate today, it's about 230 feet of water, about 50 miles off the coast. We think this is a potential suspect worthy of investigation because it is in the general area. It's a little bit north of where we would expect it, but with the influence of the Gulf Stream, it could have been carried north. Local fishermen have reported wreckage in this area, and Mike's looking for it on his sonar. We just ran over the target. It's low profile. It's fairly small, which you'd expect for an aircraft. Because at this point now, it's just time to suit up and go check it out. The target's more than 220 feet down. Mike thinks it could be a plane, but he can't yet tell whether it's the Mariner. Visibility at this depth is limited, and a strong current makes the search really challenging. We know we're close. There's a lot of fish and shipwrecks. They attract fish, so we know we're in the vicinity. Then... Out of the gloom, the divers spot something. That's the nose wheel of the aircraft. And just a stone's throw away, the rusted fuselage of a large aircraft. As an aircraft wreck site, this is quite interesting. You have a lot of intact structure there. Typically, over time, these aircraft are just bits and pieces on the seabed. So to see something like this is quite spectacular. Could this be the wreckage of the Mariner rescue plane? The next step is to record any evidence that might identify the aircraft. They spot pylons along the wings, which look like they could have been mounts for pontoons. The aircraft seems to have been amphibious. Portholes on the side of the fuselage are what you expect to find on a Mariner. And the shape of the horizontal stabilizer looks familiar to the divers from photographs of the airplane. It suggests this could be the amphibious Mariner rescue plane, but the team hasn't found a definitive piece of evidence. It's definitely a plane. I want to be very careful what I say, but there are some very interesting features. There's a lot of things you expect for a search and rescue aircraft to have. And I want to get back and look some pictures and video to some observations. I'm excited, very excited. Something that warrants further scrutiny. 
Mike needs an expert opinion to identify the plane. So he shows the dive footage to an aviation historian, Roy Stafford. Okay. Roy's a former U.S. Navy pilot and an authority on American military aircraft. This is the very start of the dive. We've, we've made our way to the bottom and we're heading up current to find the wreck. And as you can see, we're starting to see some debris come into view here. We originally were diving this with the, the hopes of finding the PBM-5 Martin Mariner. But as we're cruising around the site looking at uh, some of the features, we're, we're seeing things that are inconsistent with that. And so we're kind of left with the question, what aircraft is this? Well, judging by the uh, brake system and the uh, tire that was on there, it would be a uh, post-World War II aircraft. Okay. I could tell that right off the bat. That looks like it's obviously part of the, uh, the cockpit, uh, the top of it, the, the windows. Roy is 100% certain this wreck's not the Mariner they've been looking for. But if the wreckage isn't the missing search and rescue plane, then what is it? The answer could help resolve another triangle mystery. It is significant down here, the porthole that you see there may be a porthole for a camera. Exactly, and we, we and actually see several of them inside that were very prominent that really caught our attention. Mm -hmm. You see there's and, twin uh, engine. That pretty much ices it. There's only two possibilities, two pylons, one on each side would be an, either an RB-66, which usually wouldn't have a reason to be in that area, or the Navy A-3. It doesn't take Roy long to conclusively identify the type of plane. It's beyond a doubt an A3 Skyward by you know, comparing the fuselage and the pylons underneath the wings, the sweep back on the horizontal tail, the fact that the landing gear retract into the fuselage, these are all absolute indices of, of it being an A3 Sky Warrior. The A-3 Sky Warrior was the largest carrier-launched aircraft in the U.S. Navy in its day. And Navy files show that in 1960, one crashed while attempting a carrier landing in this area. It's highly likely that this is the wrecked A-3 that Mike and his team have tracked down. But Flight 19 and the Mariner rescue plane remain lost. The search continues to find this aircraft. We know it's out there. It's just a matter of finding the exact place. If we were to drain the vast abyssal plain around the Bahamas, somewhere out there we'd almost certainly find the lost patrol. And based on the condition of other wrecked planes found on the sea floor, this is how we'd expect them to look after seven decades in the sea. As we drain even more water from the Bermuda Triangle and head deeper, we'll encounter other bizarre phenomena. In the Bahamas, ancient tales speak of sea monsters hidden in deep underwater caves, beasts, that consume people and ships. Now scientists are uncovering the extraordinary truth behind these legends. Just 50 miles off the coast of Florida, at the Bermuda Triangle's western point, lie the Bahamas. An archipelago of more than 700 islands. Here we encounter one of the Triangle's most mysterious natural forces. Whirlpools that, according to local legends, can suck down people and ships. With the ocean's drain to nearly three miles, a stunning landscape is revealed. The Bahamas sit atop a vast limestone plateau that rears up from the seabed. It's known as the Great Bahama Bank. Cliffs taller than any found on dry land soar nearly 15,000 feet, almost three times higher than the Grand Canyon. Closer to the shoreline, another phenomenon. Some of the strangest geological rock formations found
anywhere in the world. They're called the Blue Holes. Gigantic underwater cavities extending hundreds of feet below sea level. Dean's Blue Hole is the biggest and deepest of them all. Tom Iliff is one of the world's leading blue hole experts and well aware of the dangers. There have been instances where people get too close to the edge and there's a very steep slope of sand that drops down into the blue hole. If you're not careful, one step over the ledge and you go sliding down into it. Over the years, Dean's Blue Hole has claimed several lives. Locals tend to keep their distance, warned off by some alarming supernatural tales. In the Bahamas, there's a lot of stories and folk legends pertaining to blue holes. One of them is that there's a monster called the Luska that lives down in the blue hole, and the water coming in and out is actually the Luska, this monster, inhaling and exhaling water. There's stories of ships coming in close to the blue hole and actually being sucked down by the inhalation of Luska. Incredibly, Tom has observed whirlpools at Dean's Blue Hole, just like those spoken of in the legends. When the tide's been going in, I've seen as many as three vortexes or whirlpools simultaneously sucking water down into this cave. Tom's eager to find a rational explanation for this strange phenomenon. There's a tidal effect at work here. But could there also be other forces operating in the Blue Hole's largely uncharted depths? The only way to find out is to dive. Tom's been exploring Blue Holes in the Bahamas for more than 20 years, and they never fail to impress. They're portals to a, another world. When we dive in this, it's like going to no other place on the planet. The blue holes are an unusual natural feature that geologists now think they understand. In the last ice age, sea levels were lower. Back then, all this limestone was above ground. Acidic rainwater percolated down into the limestone, eroding large voids in the rock. Eventually, the ceiling of a void collapsed in, creating the distinctive blue hole bottle shape. As sea levels rose at the end of the Ice Age, the entire feature was submerged. As Tom dives down into Dean's blue hole, it suddenly widens out. When we get down to a depth of 60 feet, we have about 150 feet or so across the chamber. As we go deeper below, at a depth of about 80 feet, it breaks again and opens and again doubles in size, probably 300 feet across the system. Then, 120 feet down, Tom spots what appear to be side tunnels branching off the main funnel. They're small, but exert a powerful suction force. These have strong tidal currents that were trying to suck us in. We only went a short distance, but on the way back, we had to literally pull ourselves hand over hand in order to get out of them. At 150 feet, Tom's at the limit for this dive. He's never ventured deeper. A tiny number of expert divers have braved it. One descending to an incredible 663 feet. But the depths remain largely unexplored. Yet we do know enough to drain Dean's Blue Hole. Revealing the vast bottle-shaped cave and a branching network of tunnels and fissures further down into the depths. It's the flow of water in and out of these tunnels that generates the whirlpool effect, not a mythical sea monster. Without water, Dean's Blue Hole is an ominous, yet entirely natural, geological structure.
The Bahamas Blue Holes may be slowly giving up their secrets. But there are many more unexplained phenomena at work in the Bermuda Triangle. Strange tales of gigantic walls of water appearing out of nowhere. And a curious underwater substance covering the seabed with the potential to destroy ships. March, 1918. A U.S. Navy cargo ship sets sail from Barbados. The USS Cyclops is a large 19,000-ton bulk carrier. She's transporting a cargo of manganese ore, and there are 309 men on board. One day out of port, she enters some of the deepest waters in the Bermuda Triangle area and simply disappears. No trace of the massive ship or its crew has ever been recovered. For Marvin Barash, the story's linked with personal tragedy. My great uncle, Lawrence Merkel, was a fireman on board the ship. He was uh, in his early 20s, and uh, he was among the 309 lost. Typically, when ships are lost, something is found. Whether it's part of a uh, lifeboat, whether it's some cargo, some piece of wreckage, something turns up eventually. In her case, nothing. The absence of any scrap of wreckage soon gives rise to some wild theories. All kinds of bizarre stories came out. There was a Washington, D.C. newspaper that claimed that she had been taken over and had been turned into a pirate ship and was running in Amazon waters. Others were saying that she had been taken over by a German submarine, even as far as gigantic sea life like octopus. There were some pictures of such uh, incidents in some newspapers across the country. Marvin has devoted his life to finding out what really happened to the Cyclops. He's scoured every document and record linked to the ship. It's taken decades of painstaking research, but he now believes he's identified a fatal weakness in the ship's design. She was, at one time, the largest and fastest U.S. Navy ship afloat. She had a flat bottom. She rolled quite easily. And on one day, she rolled approximately 50 degrees one way and in the high 40s the other way. And to many vessels, that could have just continued and caused a complete catastrophe. So given the ship's tendency to roll, did something happen to tip her over? something extraordinary. For centuries, mariners have spun tales of rogue waves. Enormous walls of water appearing out of nowhere, overwhelming any ship in their path. The idea of rogue waves has been the thing of legend for many, many hundreds of years. Mariners come back reporting having seen these waves, having experienced and survived these rogue waves. According to Dr. Simon Boxall, these old tales can no longer be ignored. By using satellites, we can observe the entire world uh, in a few days. And so we have, over the last 20 years, observed and measured freak waves, which are, in some cases, in excess of 100 feet. So they do exist. Supersized waves have occasionally been captured on film. This one, in the winter of 2012, slammed into an emergency response vessel in the North Sea. Given the Bermuda Triangle's extreme weather patterns, rogue waves on a similar scale may be possible. You have North Atlantic, you have equatorial storms, the hurricane system's coming through on a regular basis. And you've got storms coming off the Gulf of Mexico. And these come together to create a very confused and a very turbulent sea with freak waves. So did the Triangle's turbulent seas produce a freak wave large enough to sink the Cyclops? The Bermuda Triangle has long been thought of as a place of mystery. We're using
using the latest technology to drain it layer by layer and possibly dispel the myths. Sometimes, experimental science can help tackle a long-standing puzzle. Plymouth University in southern England, the Coast Laboratory Wave Tank. This is one of the most advanced wave tanks in the United Kingdom. It can simulate a wide range of the ocean conditions that occur in the Bermuda Triangle. Scientists here take the theory of rogue or freak waves very seriously. Let's go for a focus location of 16 meters. Today, these oceanographers are conducting an experiment to determine whether a rogue wave could have sunk a large vessel like the missing U.S. Navy ship, the Cyclops. The team deploys a scale model comparable in size to the Cyclops. First, they generate a normal wave pattern. With waves the equivalent of 25 feet high, the vessel remains stable. But when they simulate the impact of two storm fronts converging, there's soon interference in the wave pattern. And suddenly, as if out of nowhere, a rogue wave. It's the equivalent of a wave more than 50 feet high, and its impact on the scale model is clear. So there is evidence that a rogue wave could theoretically have sunk the Cyclops. But there's another bizarre phenomenon that could explain the loss of the ship. On the seabed, at depths below 1,100 feet, deposits of a strange, milky, waxy material can be found. A single patch can cover an area bigger than Manhattan. It's a substance called methane hydrate. These methane hydrates are formed as a result of material from the surface, organic material, dead fish, dead plants, plankton, sinking to the seafloor and then degrading through uh, bacterial decay, microbial decay. This footage shows actual clumps of methane hydrate on the seabed. Methane can also get trapped in pockets beneath the ocean floor. 1981, in the South China Sea, a drill ship hit a shallow gas pocket, causing a blowout. As gas bubbled to the surface, it made the ship unstable, leading it to capsize and eventually sink. Any large-scale disturbance on the seabed, such as an earthquake or landslide, could dislodge a substantial slab of methane hydrate which turns to gas as it floats to the surface. So a methane hydrate release could potentially have caused the USS Cyclops to capsize, especially given that her design left her prone to rolling. But the only way to determine what really happened to the ship is to find her wreckage. Having studied as much as I could about approximately how far the ship may have made it, from her departure point. I think she probably was about a day out of port, and she probably wound up around the northwest area of Puerto Rico. Marvin's hopeful that the wreckage site may one day be found. To find the resting place of Cyclops and my great uncle and all the others who served with him would mean a lot. But if Marvin's calculations are correct, the ship won't be easy to recover. Draining the area reveals a trench up to five miles deep. The Puerto Rico Trench. This is where the triangle reaches its deepest point. In fact, it's the deepest point in the entire Atlantic. As scientists explore the massive underwater feature, they're finding it could conceal the deadliest of all the Bermuda Triangle's secrets. 
the source of a potentially devastating tsunami. The deepest part of the Bermuda Triangle, the Puerto Rico Trench, may conceal its deadliest secret. So scientists race to explore this inaccessible underwater region. Here, in the National Geographic Society's remote imaging laboratories, they've developed a radical new technology for filming the deep ocean. It's called drop cam. Perfect, good to go. After years of development, lead engineer Eric Birkenpass tests his camera in the ocean off Chile. It's unpowered. A heavy weight pulls the camera down. There was still a lot of butterflies in our stomach when we actually threw it over the side into the real ocean. When the team deploys it in the Puerto Rico trench, it takes an hour and a half to travel the five miles to the bottom. It's programmed to spend several hours more on the ocean bed, then resurface and transmit its position. There's a huge sense of relief when you first hear that VHF beacon on your radio transmitter and you see that satellite fix. These are among the first images from the bottom of the Puerto Rico Trench, five miles straight down. The deep sea imaging project has given us a window into one of the great unexplored regions of planet Earth. But their images are a series of snapshots capturing an area of just a few square feet at a time. In order to drain the whole Puerto Rico trench, we need much more data. U.S. Geological Survey scientist Yuri Ten Brink is attempting to map the entire feature and believes there's a pressing need to do so. We started researching this trench because it is very similar geometrically to the Sumatra Trench, where the 2004 Sumatra earthquake and big tsunami happened. And that was a big worry here because a magnitude 9 earthquake on the Puerto Rico Trench can unleash a tsunami that will hit the U.S. East Coast and even Europe. Yuri's team deploys remotely operated underwater vehicles called ROVs to scan the trench and assess the tsunami threat level. The ROVs fire sonar pulses to obtain as accurate a readout as possible. Their 3D mapping reveals the sheer sides of vast underwater canyons. In some of the valleys and rifts, there are sometimes walls that can be like 1,000 meter high or something like that. Geologists have long known the trench formed as the edge of the North American tectonic plate moved underneath the Caribbean plate and simultaneously slid against it. But what the new data suggests is that this could be prime underwater landslide terrain. They can move rocks in areas that are many hundreds of kilometers squared size of big cities and more actually the thickness of the rocks can be 200 meters or more so you are talking about all together 10 20 kilometer cubes sometimes so an underwater landslide on this scale might potentially threaten the eastern u.s with a tsunami just as yuri feared you think of boston of charleston of baltimore and you think of all the nuclear power stations that are along the coast and so you have to prepare for it. The terrifying impact of a tsunami on an insufficiently protected nuclear power station is now understood. Following the 2011 Fukushima disaster, for an equivalent tsunami to reach the US, there would have to be a magnitude nine earthquake in the trench. To assess the odds of a quake on this scale, Yuri's team sampled rock cut from the bottom. Back in the lab, they were able to reach conclusions about the threat to East Coast residents 
and those living closer to the trench. From our current understanding, we are not sure that it's capable of such large earthquakes. That not to say that it's not capable of big earthquakes, magnitude 8 to 8.5, that could also happen. They may not hit the, the, the U.S. East Coast, but they will still cause tremendous damage in the Caribbean. It's also possible that an earthquake centered in the trench could trigger a methane hydrate release, a further clue that these may be responsible for some of the area's notorious disappearances. Yuri's completed data allow us to drain 500 miles of the Puerto Rico Trench. Given its vast scale and immense depth, it's perhaps no surprise many of the Triangle's missing ships and planes remain lost. There are spectacular sheer cliffs several miles high. It's truly an awe-inspiring landscape at the very bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Five miles down. Draining the Bermuda Triangle has shown a stunning range of highly varied terrain. Including some of the strangest features known to exist in our oceans. The myths and legends of the Triangle are persistent and deep-rooted. Yet we've discovered that the dangers posed by this area don't appear to come from any supernatural phenomena, but from the very real and very deadly forces of Mother Nature herself.